toad, you better go out and no, I'm just kidding. You'll be good. I talked to a local beekeeper here in town and he tells us that the bees are our friends. And actually, if you leave them alone and let them do this job this summer, you should be a-okay. When you start laughing at me, it's when... <laughs> Yeah, you chuckled. I'm like, oh, I got him to laugh. So, hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, June the 2nd. This is Back Our Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 210. I'm Frederick Dunn. This is the way to be. And those are bees in the way to be. And bees behind me and bees in front of me. And look at the differences. Uh, I know we've had these in the background for a couple of Q&As. So you can see their progress. And they are nearly honeybound, which is very interesting to me. We haven't had rain for a long time. I know you want to know about the weather. 85.8 degrees Fahrenheit right now. That's 30 degrees Celsius. 1.3 mile per hour winds. We get some wind gusts, 4 miles per hour and so on. Rain, zero. Not just that, the rain in the forecast is even sketchy. So this is not a time to be mowing your property. Because taller grass, deeper roots, more sustainable against uh, drought conditions and low rain. But uh, looking at the observation hives and the beehives out in the apiary, this has not impacted them regarding nectar gathering because they're full. And in fact, I have a note on my whiteboard over here that we need to be supering the larger colonies as soon as possible. So they're in a rapid growth state, no feeding on any of them, nobody. Not even the recent swarm captures because they're bringing in the resources right away. Relative humidity is only 35%. That's great when they're dehydrating honey, when they're dehydrating the nectar, turning it into honey, going through all the conversion process. I don't know if you can hear the bees, but uh, they're all fanning. Although these don't seem to be heat stressed. We don't see a lot of fanning and moving the air across the brood. It is 90 degrees inside this building. So, uh, but that, you know, low humidity makes it easier for them to dry things out. If it were rain, 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 then of course the humidity would be high and it's harder to dehydrate. Also, don't forget to make sure that you're uh, putting out lots of water, have resources for your bees, because if there's fresh water available, they can cover it. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and you're going to see all the items that we're going to discuss. These topics were submitted during the past week, some as recent as this morning. So let's get right into it with question number one. Uh, this comes from Jane Mondovi, Wisconsin. First time beekeeper, I installed two nukes on May 13th. One was stronger than the other. I inspected on 520 and both had brood and eggs. Good sign. So pollen and some honey, one hive still stronger than the other. I put another box on the stronger hive. My question, should I be concerned that the weaker one is still behind. Nope. I don't worry about it. I like the uh, underdog colonies because it's fun to see them take off. If you recall, uh, earlier, just a couple of weeks ago, this whole top frame didn't have much, if any, progress on it. Now it's almost finished. The top frame, so that's the equivalent of two deeps. So then that would be the third. These are in groups of three. And the upper ones are nothing but honey. This is half honey, still some brood in it. The brood is moving down. And all of these colonies have top boxes full of nothing but honey. And uh, the one that you're not seeing is, they're capping it while I'm sitting here. The capping progress is day to day evident. They are making rapid progress. So this is the time when you have to keep up with your bees day by day because they're really making progress fast and it's surprising people. I don't know about where you are, but swarms are everywhere this year. People that had very few beehives, very few colonies in their apiaries, now have an abundance, their equipment's full, swarms are everywhere. So apparently the conditions in spring were perfect for swarm production. So that's why everybody on social media has something to say about swarms. And I posted a couple of videos on swarms this past week. So if you didn't catch those, you go to my YouTube channel, which is Frederick Dunn, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, Dunn. And then you look at that and you look at the latest videos. And you're going to see that I like to show you different ways of collecting and hiving swarms. The most recent one being that I just used a butterfly net and uh, collected a swarm somewhere else, put it in a... Hive butler toad, the vented top kind, 
and uh, brought it back. And then I sat in front of a hive thinking they would move right in. So I sat there holding my butterfly net with the bees in it and I didn't do anything other than provide them with a box that had drawn comb in it that had been used before by bees. So it had that going for it. There's no swarm commander, no lemongrass oil, nothing else was in there. I just wanted to see if they would come up over that thing and go inside the beehive and they did. But the thing was, I sat there holding that uh, butterfly net for about 45 minutes they didn't do it quick. So if you've got a lot of patience, that's a fun video to watch. But as far as one colony being stronger than another, I never worry about that uh, because the key things are happening. There's brood, there's eggs, there's pollen, and they're productive. So one of the things you might want to watch when you have a brand new colony that's just getting going is what's the arrangement of the brood. So if things look consistent and well ordered and there's not a bunch of spotty brood or she's not laying all over the place or shows some example that uh, she's poorly mated or something like that, I think they're fine. Not only that, they'll even out. Beehives that are side by side with one another don't even forage the same areas. So that's good. I mean, in my opinion, that's great. You can watch their waggle dances. In these, you can see the waggle dances and it's a great teaching tool because you know the position of the sun, you can see where they're headed out and what direction they're gonna go relevant to the sun. Now, this colony way back here has eight or nine bees doing waggle dances, all giving the same directions and the waggles are really long. In other words, when they cut to the right and then they do their little waggle, which is giving an angle relevant to the position of the sun, uh, the waggle that lasts a really long time means they're going really far. So those bees back there are covering some ground. You might be wondering how far can a bee forage? Well, the general rule of thumb is two to three miles maximum in any direction, especially on a day like today where we have low wind conditions, they're not fighting a headwind. And uh, those back there, again, they're overproductive too. All my bees are overproductive. We are going to get a June honey crop. I already know they're going to build up a surplus we're going to have to take it off either that or you build supersized colonies which i don't like to do so i like to remove the frames of capped honey as they go leaving them enough resources in the event that something happens where we get a bunch of rain that lasts for a week or so and they have the resources that they need inside the hive so don't leave them without resources even this time of year but if they're really building up and you're trying to keep your colony somewhat small and manageable then you can take off uh, frames of honey. One of the ways you can do that is pulling, when you have just the honey super, like the top box in this would just be honey, once they're all getting capped, you can checkerboard. And that means every other frame, so you leave them a frame of capped honey, you pull a frame out, replace it with just a frame that's got foundation. Leave capped honey, pull a frame, and so on. So that we give them more space to expand, they're in a wax building mode right now, so they'll draw those combs so we can take advantage of the warmth that we have right now. They like to do that in warm weather when there's lots of resources coming in. It's exactly what they're doing. The nucleus hives that I have out there, the five frame deep nuke boxes that are stacked up, that top box is a comb building factory. So if you're interested in creating resource hives and you can set up nucleus boxes, I prefer the wooden ones, um, you can uh, use that top box to build cut comb, for example. So if you're doing Ross rounds or something and you've got those um, Cirocell brackets for them so they fit a standard deep, uh, you can put those in your top box of your nuke and they build them really fast. That uh, narrow high column seems to be really conducive to them building a lot of wax. So you can take advantage of that and get some nice comb honey out of it. So anyway, we'll move on to question number two. This comes from Nikki. It says, I have several honey frames that have unripe nectar that I forgot to spin out before storing them for the winter. I shook them out as best I could yesterday, but unsure about two things. Number one, are they safe for the bees to work them? And number two, would the residual fermentation ruin my new honey crop? So those are two... If it's fresh honey and it's, it's good and you extracted late or whatever, and it doesn't smell bad, this is key. Smelling that it's fermented or sour, the bees don't like that at all. So I highly recommend cold, fresh water, washing them out, inverting it, shaking them out, and then uh, drying them off before putting them back in. Or if you've got weather like mine right now, 
once you rinse them out really good and uh, you can't smell the sour smell anymore, I would put them right in the hive because the bees can actually use that fresh water that would still be on it and they'll be drying that out pretty quick on their own. So it also goes on to say, um, would it ruin the honey crop? I wouldn't, you know, the bees would have to clean it up. They don't tolerate high water content. So better that you do it because one of the risks of putting fermented honey in, um, depending on the situation and how long these bees have been there, you can force and abscond. They might not like it if you really alter things and they don't feel that they can deal with it, especially this time of year when absconding is a pretty decent gamble. There's a good chance they could find a good place to be. So if you want to know what kind of resources are available where you are, you could go to Beescape, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E dot org and type in your location and you'll find out, number one, are you going to have a dearth where you live? When will it happen? And this is based on historical data. You'll also find out if there's agricultural chemicals in your area being used that might impact your bees. So they give a, a grade on that and also whether or not the environment has places for feral colonies of bees to survive. So it's all good information if you, especially for those who haven't set up an aviary yet and you're looking. So um, that's it for Nikki. Question number three. Okay, I have heard uh, Hussam Ben Abdallah. This comes from uh, Tunisia. So I have a very hot hive. They start attacking, just getting near it, or working the adjacent hives, let alone opening it. I have tried to requeen it, but I failed to find the queen many times because it was overwhelmed by bees. Besides, I'm reluctant to use the shake above the queen, uh, over the queen excluder, and that method because it's going to agitate the bees even more with beekeeping in mind, there's livestock and neighbors in the area. As much as I know, a resident queen will attack any other queen in the hive. So my question is, did anybody manufacture or is there a DIY idea for a queen trap with a pheromone that mimics the smell of another queen in it? Okay, that's hard to do. Um, I highly recommend that you put on your best bee suit and you get in there and you don't quit until you find the queen. You're going to have to because... Um, your only other option is euthanizing the colony if you're not willing to deal with the genetics. Installing another queen in a cage or something like that won't drive out the existing queen. So it's, those are huge gambles. Now here's the problem I have. When we're beekeepers and we're backyard beekeepers, these are not commercial operations. And as described here, residential area, livestock is adjacent. So the beekeeper is responsible for maintaining the safety of people around their hives and livestock. So um, this actually came up with other people too, as they've got hot hives. Now, there's not a very good description here about how hot the hive is. What does that mean? When you're in the bee yard, are there five bees constantly in your veil? Um, are you met by three or four bees that just won't leave you alone? Or is it hundreds of them all over your veil? I've had people talk with me that had so many bees on their veil, uh, they couldn't see through it. So they were constantly shaking them off, blowing them off, trying to find their way out of their own apiary. Uh, so that's an extreme case. So there are levels, but uh, we don't want people to get stung. So the other part of that is getting in there, finding the queen, removing the queen, and uh, leaving the eggs in there so that uh, they can produce a emergency queen cell and then uh, replace their queen. They can do that on their own. And it does a number of things. One, uh, the population of the hive is dwindling the whole time that uh, the new queen is being produced and there are no new eggs being laid. So um, the stock that you have is still from the queen that you just killed. So don't expect an immediate change in attitude from the hive because those workers, those foragers and everything else all those genetics are still there. You do have the option to euthanize the colony. Um, so then you're a month out before you start seeing the new bees from a new queen. If you were to put one in right away, that's laying that you know the genetics of. And this is why it's important too sometimes to have resource hives, uh, nukes and things like that, that you can go and pull full frames of brood with a queen on it and use that kind of as a hostile takeover. But often I've found that if you've got really defensive bees 
It's not the queen that attacks the incoming foreign queen. It's the workers. They'll attack that queen. They'll form a ball around that queen when they reject her. And they'll heat up until she's dead. So they heat themselves to the edge of death just to kill off the queen. So it's the workers that do that. A queen only attacks other queens generally. When you have multiple queen cells and one emerges first, she'll go out, chew into the side of a cell, sting the queen that's in there that hasn't hatched yet. So that's a different kind of conflict. An established queen that you bring a foreign queen into, the foreign queen has foreign pheromones, she gets attacked nine times out of 10 by the population of the hive. They're the ones who are gonna kill her, drive her out, chew her wings off, and even try to sting her. But it's called balling the queen when they form a big heat ball around her and they just generate so much heat, they suffocate her and kill her. So um, it's a patience game too, because once the queen's out, remember the behavior of those bees doesn't necessarily change until you have a complete turnover of their genetics. So, but I would definitely get them under control. And uh, the other part of this is, I think me personally, if I had a queen that was that bad and I couldn't find her, I don't want her to escape. I don't want there to be a swarm. Uh, this often happens too, and people have a hostile hive. They're building up, the numbers are big, and before you know it, they've swarmed out. Well, you just sent those genetics, those hot genetics, out into the environment. So I highly recommend that you put an entrance queen excluder on to make sure that that queen can't get away and that you find her, you collect her, and you dispatch her. Question number four, you have to hold your ground. That's what, we have a responsibility. I don't want anybody to be upset that my bees went hostile on their kids or, you know, especially elderly people, children, small animals, who knows. Question number four comes from Marion from Kirksville, Missouri. Would transferring frames from an older deep hive body painted white to a new natural colored eco wood treated hive body cause a big problem for this young colony that was a swarm capture from early April? It's the only hive in the apiary at the moment. So my opinion about that, no. Uh, what really matters to the bees, you could change colors on your hives, uh, what really matters to the bees is the physical location of your hive. So you benefit them a lot. The fact that it's the only hive in the apiary makes it very easy for your bees to find it. Uh, for those of you who have multiple beehives in your backyard, as I do, or up to 30 now, unfortunately, um, I put them next to trees, next to rocks, next to unique um, landscape markers so that when the bees are coming in to find their entrances and stuff like that, uh, it's very clear where they live. So they remember shapes and everything. They remember the location very well. Um, so that's more important. Changing from a white hive to an eco wood hive is not a problem at all. So the other thing is entrance configurations, entrance positions. And I don't recommend that you move those around a lot. So once you set up your entrance on your the front of your beehive, try to keep it in the same location because remember, your bees are working hard to build infrastructure in the hive that helps them move air efficiently and resources efficiently, dependent upon where that fresh air entrance source is. So shifting that around a lot, it doesn't you know, make it impossible. It's just a small challenge for the bees, but even the slightest shift and you'll see your foragers coming back with an entrance right here, they'll be running into where the entrance used to be over and over and it is very interesting and at the same time frustrating because they seem to take a long time to figure out those changes. Question number five comes from Curious Koi. That's the YouTube name. Now this was related to the video that he did where I showed the nuke where I was holding the butterfly net in front of it and waiting for the bees to go in. I made a comment on that that this is my existing nuke configuration. It's a solid box, solid bottom, the bottom's attached. There's an entrance in the front, so it doesn't even have a landing board. Uh, I mentioned that I would like to have screen bottom boards on my nukes, and uh, that because I have a bunch of these already, I'm just using them up. And then this is where Curious Koi writes, wait, why do you want your nuke to have a screen bottom board with removable trays? 
I thought you absolutely didn't like screen bottoms. I thought you liked one entrance and insulated top level. Newt for resource hive, so you want the ability for mites to fall through the screen, question mark. And so, yeah, here, so I wanted to explain that I don't like screen bottom boards. And then I do like screen bottom boards, so I'll explain the difference. Screen bottom boards open to the outside are something I don't like for a lot of reasons. Bees tend to collect underneath of it, everything flying by smells what's going on inside the hive, and it also takes away a lot of air movement control on the part of the bees. I do like screen bottom boards when there's an enclosure around it and there's a tray underneath that I can remove to inspect. I can't do that with a solid bottom board that's part of the beehive. So an example of that, this is not for a nuke of course, this is for a full size hive, but I'm evaluating a bottom board. It's a big one. This particular bottom board uh, is made by one of my viewers and uh, doing research, getting feedback, stuff like that. It has a built-in slatted rack. So I'm gonna pick that up here. And the slatted rack, so what I'm doing is I'm providing feedback. I do have this out in the bee yard now being used by the bees. This is the slatted rack. It's made out of um, ply material. So there are layers to it. And uh, the bees are chewing that. I can say that part right now. Inside is an aluminum screened bottom board, heavy duty. And I do like that because even passively, a screened bottom board will remove about 15% of your mites passively, no extra effort involved. And the key there is they're supposed to fall out and not be able to get back into the hive. So we have the landing board on the front here. And this was configured with hive gates, by the way. Those are not in for this demonstration. And then we're seeing it from the back here. So on the back, it has a removable cover and uh, see these little metal plates here? Magnets hold it in place. And then we have a cafeteria style tray that you pull out on the bottom. That's what I like. This whole thing is closed up. It's effectively a solid bottom board as far as um, closing it up, giving them all the control that they need. You control the size of the entrance. The entrance is three eighths of an inch high. I like that because mice can't get into it and you can control the width of it. So this is interesting and this particular one is also going out in the uh, bee yard this week. But this is what I like. So, and the screen comes out too. So, that's what I mean by a screen bottom board that I would like to have on nukes. And the reason is, if I had that on a nucleus hive, I would be better informed about what's going on inside that hive. Uh, I can pull those trays after an oxalic acid vaporization treatment and not harass the bees anymore and see what kind of mite drop I have on the tray. Also, I can use it as a teaching tool to show people what's in the bottom of the tray. And over time, several weeks, uh, these hives in here all have removable inserts underneath of them. So they have screen bottom boards with removable core flute inserts under that. Uh, what I really like about that is if I even see one mite on one of those drop trays, I know that some mite in there at some point has ended its life. So when I don't mean that it ended its life, I mean it came to the end of its life. And then they'll just screw them off and drop them at the bottom. All of these bees are heavy groomers. So they were also all treated in wintertime for mites and I've yet to find a mite on these bees in any of my observation hives. Now, I don't know if uh, this is in Northwestern Pennsylvania. I don't know if we're having a really good mite year or not across the board. Is it just me? I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to count mites. I'm paying close attention to the drones, uh, trying to get mites out of the drone brood, and I can't find any. So uh, I'm highly suspicious of that. I don't want to get a false sense of comfort. Um, but screen bottom boards, removable trays underneath are an excellent tool for us to find out what's going on in the hive. Uh, and as I mentioned before, people have done oxalic acid vaporization treatments on packages of bees and things like that. It saves us from having to dig right back into the package and do more mite counts on the bees. If 
hundreds of mites end up on the bottom tray, as some viewer wrote in last week, I believe, uh, then we have a big problem. The other thing is you want to see if your treatments are working. So when you give that treatment, you should see a bunch of dead mites. And a subsequent treatment would produce a bunch of dead mites again until eventually the treatment that you give produces few or none. Then you'll know no more mites left in there uh, to be treated. You can do mite counts, you can do sugar shakes and things like that. The other thing is, uh, if I had the mites, if even a couple of them showed up in the space of five days on these bottom boards in here, uh, we're in a capped root time frame here too. So it's not great. We're into probably a late July dearth period, so another opportunity uh, later in the summer when uh, the bees would be uh, with a smaller brood area and therefore they would be uh, prone to being treated for varrodestructor mites. And we're still gonna pay attention to those drones, but I haven't found a drone with a mite on it. Hmm. Good news, haven't found a worker bee, a nurse bee with a mite on her yet either. So I don't know what's going on, I don't trust it. I did just get a swarm that we hived this week that I mentioned before, and on the eighth day, they're installed on the eighth day. I'm treating them. And uh, here's the thing. Now what do I have to do? Because I don't have bottom boards that remove. I don't have a screen in there. Now I give it an oxalic as a vaporization treatment. What do I have to do? I have two choices unless I want to kill them. I have to open the hive. I have to scoop up the bees. I have to give them a sugar shake until I get the mite count or I can put them in my CO2, which knocks them out, but the CO2 cylinders are expensive, that costs me more money, but uh, they do recover after they are knocked out from CO2, you can do the mite count, but uh, the sugar shake done right, carefully done, uh, will produce very good and accurate readings of the mite loads. So you need to know, was it effective? Did they have mites and uh, what's going on? I am suspicious of any swarm of bees that comes to my apiary that is not from this apiary. So that's pretty much it. And that's my explanation. I don't like screen bottom boards by themselves open to the outside. There are people even in this state that use that, swear by it, love it, leave them open all the time. I don't like it because uh, just based on the models that I've seen of how they move things around, we also sometimes end up with your bees clustering underneath, clinging to the screen because it's open. And that for me is when skunks can access those bees and just munch away at them for hours at a time. So if they're enclosed, yes, excellent tool, passive mite, integrated pest management, good choice. Open to the ground, no. So I hope I explained the difference. And if any of you are asking about that bottom board with the built-in slatted rack, the aluminum screen and the removable tray, that's a prototype uh, if and he's getting feedback from those who are testing it and when and if they become available for sale and I think that is the long-term plan I will let you know so that's that for screen bottom boards and yes even in this hot weather I don't have top vents I don't have um, upper entrances I'm not using queen excluders and uh, they're arranging themselves in a very predictable way with just a uh, single entrance on the bottom board. Next one comes from Jean Lavallee, or Lavallee, I'm not sure. It says, I asked the apiary when I purchased my bees what kind they are, and they kind of shrugged and said that none of them are purebred really anymore, so they couldn't tell me the exact type. My question is, if I get a box of bees in the future or become in need of a queen, does it really matter the type when ordering or would any species of European honeybee purchase work? Okay, so here's the thing. Um, you'll often hear backyard beekeepers say that we're keeping mutts. I'm included in that because I'm not a bee breeder. So I don't control the genetics. I like um, the traits that I'm seeing in my own bees. And I see those continually reinforced in new colonies and when they swarm or when I make splits and things like that. Wherever they're flying out to mate the new queens and they're mating with drones, I'm getting my own traits back, it seems. So it looks like over the past 17 years, maybe I've had an impact on my bee environment here. 
when it comes to breeding, I don't breed, but it's it's not true that there aren't any known um, lines of bees, races of bees, and things like that. There are, and there are a lot of people that go to great effort to preserve those, and they have very specific. Um, strengths related to what the beekeeper wants. So the biggest um, kind of genetic monitoring and maintenance of genetic lines occurs in commercial beekeeping. They want all their bees to do the right thing at the right time in the right place. So maybe they're breeding for honey, maybe they're breeding for varroa resistance, maybe we want the Purdue ankle biters. Uh, buck fast bees are still out there. But uh, when it comes to breeding true, you have to have control of the genetics and most backyard beekeepers just don't have that. So um, the statement that there just aren't any of those anymore, that's not true, there are. So, and this is why I've said in the past, um, if I needed a queen suddenly and I needed a mated queen, and this was largely before I started using my own uh, nucleus resource hives, which are giving me everything I've needed, um, in recent years. So, but if I were queenless and I needed one for something in particular, or I wanted to freshen kind of the genetics around here, um, I go to Bee Weaver and I buy the Bee Weaver Queens just because I like the philosophy of the family. I like uh, the genetics that they're using and some of their genetics go back to the Buckfast line. And uh, so there are carniolas that people like to get. You should still support the breeders that are breeding true and maintaining those lines. Because I think we as backyard beekeepers um, kind of have a responsibility to pay them back once in a while and support them by buying their queens. Uh, if people are just raising general queen stock, in other words, regionalized queens that just do really well, really well where they live, um, you'd have a hard time figuring out, you know, is that a Carniolan? Is that a Russian? Is that a Buckfast bee? So they would be then blended with whatever happens to be in the area. And this is where some commercial beekeepers are a little frustrated by backyard beekeepers because we don't control our genetics. We have favorite colonies, we have favorite hives, and we want to breed from them. But the truth of that is the queen that comes out of that hive uh, when they split or when we split them or they've made swarm cells, when she flies out, her genetics are altered by whatever drone she meets. So when we talk about that, um, backyard beekeepers, uh, I like regionally well-adapted bees. I know that the bees that I have right now, I don't know what they are totally. Most of them are derived from, on some level, from the bee weaver line, but I also know that a lot of them requeen annually on their own. So when they do that, I'm ending up with um, hybridized bees, but seeing how they go through winter, seeing how they manage varroa mites. If I have a varroa loaded hive or colony, I don't use that uh, line anymore. I don't reproduce from those. I don't create resource hives from that hive. I don't wipe them out, which is probably what I should do. Uh, based on knowledge that I learned this year, culling poor performing hives or hives that are susceptible to disease and that don't uh, fend off or destroy or chew or remove varroa destructor mites very well, I might um, shift to not entertaining keeping those colonies anymore and only keeping those that are demonstrating very clean regarding varroa destructor mites and excellent brood all of these things and keeping those going and then it's a game of patience over time I'm not going to alter the world with 30 colonies of bees if I had 300 colonies of bees or 100 or 150 sure I could have an impact but I need to get into my own bee breeding which is something I don't do and the only true control of the stock that you would have would be insemination. And this is where sometimes people hear about breeder queens and you'll come across the term and it's a breeder queen, it'll cost you $600 or $1,000 or whatever. And that's the stock that you get, assuming that you have your own insemination system. And then uh, what you're doing is you're creating clones of the queen. You know, basically you're breeding her own genetics to her own genetics and then you're going to have known stock, right? And uh, then you're gonna mate those with your own drones and those drones need to have traits that you're also after and so on and it's pretty complicated. 
So did a little checking up, cloning. Cloning is creating an identical copy of a honeybee by using its DNA. And cloning can be used to preserve the genetics. And I think this is what people are doing. There must be a DNA bank somewhere that people are keeping and preserving the known genetics of bee lines. I'd like to think that's happening. And then there's crossbreeding, and that involves breeding two different honeybee populations to create a new population uh, with the desired traits. That's kind of what we're doing, you know, on a loose level. And this is also why backyard beekeepers aren't liked very well sometimes because we have a tendency just to just let our bees go and just do whatever they do and we just like them for whatever there is. And then there's genetic engineering. This is the one that everybody flips out about. And I was not happy when I heard about it too because we know there's a company out there uh, that genetically modifies plants. And uh, when they genetically modify their plants, that means they can own those plants. They own the DNA. And that was a huge mistake, just my opinion, that when you allow somebody to own the DNA of a living thing, this is, I'm going to gripe about this for a minute. Um, and the company's Monsanto. I guess I could say that. I can have my opinion about them. Um, if you grow a crop and your seed blows onto somebody else's property and some other farmer's crop and your seeds cross-pollinate and then they end up saving and washing their seeds. So their seed scrubbing and stuff so that farmers can save back a percentage of their seed and then next season they can plant that and get another crop. Um, but once they've blended with owned genetics, genetically modified organisms, think about it. They didn't control where that went. Cross-pollinated your crops. Now that company owns your crops too. This is the equivalent of, I have a dog in my yard and it's a female and your male dog runs over into my dog's yard and breeds with my dog. And then my dog has puppies. But your dog is a genetically modified dog. I'm not saying that we have GMO dogs right now. But I'm saying this is kind of the logic that I see. This is the analogy. I didn't want that dog in my yard. Now I have its puppies and they own the puppies because they own the genetics. They own the DNA. So what if I told you the same company was raising their own line of genetically modified bees? So that then they could have a line of bees that you would have to get from them and uh, that they would then be immune to neonicotinoids and things like that that everybody was very upset about uh, because then they would have a line of bees that was resistant to that. So I looked into that today. I was like, did Monsanto start their own line of bees and weren't they genetically modifying the bees? Imagine that. Then they would own those genetics. Here's the good news. That fell flat, but I'm going to tell you about it. Monsanto attempted genetically engineer a honeybee line that would be resistant to pesticides. In 2007, Monsanto announced that it was working on a project to create honeybees that were resistant to the pesticide neonicotinoid. Neonicotinoids are a class of pesticides that are known to be harmful to honeybees, and they work by disrupting the bee's nervous system, which can lead to death. So anyway, it goes on to say that the goal was to have these bees, and then like anything else, now you have to go to them to get the bees that can manage just like when they grow their specific crops, you have to go to them to prep the soil. You have to go to them to get the genetically modified uh, seed that will produce plants that then you can spray with their own pesticides that only their plants are not harmed by, but all the other plants would be suppressed. So it would be kind of like that. If you want to have bees near these crops, you would have to have then the genetically modified bees that can tolerate the toxins that are associated with those crops. Here's the good news. In 2013, Monsanto announced that it was abandoning the project. The company said that it had been unable to create honeybees that were both resistant to neonicotinoids that could remain healthy. People were also flipping out about it. So anyway, by the way, Monsanto was sold off and is no longer an American company. So that's interesting too. They're gone. But when it comes to genetics now, and there's always somebody trying to create some kind of weird thing with bees. But uh, pick a bee breeder that breeds stock that you like, and we should be supporting those breeders that are preserving genetics, that are working well in today's climate, 
and uh, handling what's going on uh, with the diseases that they face, with diseases that are coming from agriculture, uh, from their exposure to pesticides, and then of course um, diseases that are, you know, insect-borne, uh, deformed wing virus, things like that. We know that this year we have a vaccination for American fowl brood. I don't know anyone who's used it. And the funny part of that is it it was so long in the making that by the time they have a vaccine that would be fed to the queen, uh, because then all the eggs that she produces then would have the vaccine, um, that American fowl brood is so, so rare right now. And that's because the response to its presence has been strong and effective. And that is burn the hive, burn the woodenware, all the gear that goes with it. Thank goodness we don't have that problem anymore. So this is my advice about the bee genetics. They still exist. People are using pure lines. And uh, pick the breeders that have uh, the stock that you prefer, that do well where you live, and uh, purchase directly from them. And this is how we support that organization. So that's what I say to that. I know I went the long way around the barn, but I kind of wanted you to get the big picture. That what we're doing in our own backyards is we're finding stock. Remember, none of these bees were already here. They were brought here by people. Um, so at some point, you know, there were Russian bees that were brought in. Uh, everything was brought in. So now all they're doing is mixing traits and uh, behaviors and physical characteristics that uh, the other contributing lines have. So interesting. And some states want to control that. Oh, that strikes me again. I think um, in Cuba, I think the government controls... Uh, they don't control all the bee genetics, but they prohibit. So in other words, the government really has a lot of control over how their bees are treated. And the bees in Cuba, across the board, are treatment free. Now, I don't know how well they do. I don't know a lot of details about that. But here's an entire nation, by the way, that went treatment free in the face of road destructor mites. So I think that's interesting, too. And we should be watching things like that to see what pans out. So that would be adaptations, right? As the bees tolerate these things. So that was my last question for today. And I did want to mention that the Bee Weaver line, I reached out to them this year and I wanted to get some of their queens to do some tests that I wanted to do. Sold out. Thank you, all of you that buy all their stock. Um, so, and they think that they will be available later in the year, but they're not available right now, which is when I wanted to do stuff with them. So and the other thing is, uh, if you've bought a pure line of uh, honeybee and you want to control it and keep it around that's a bee that you might consider marking its thorax and clipping the wings on one side university of guelph does that uh, that means when that stock leaves your hive if it swarms it's going to remain on your property it's going to be there and if you're monitoring your bees daily very good chance you're going to recover that queen be able to put her in a nucleus or other resource hive and keep those genetics right in your apiary. So if you're going to spend the money, you might want to control and keep that queen around. Now, that doesn't mean that her progeny doesn't uh, emerge from their queen cells and fly off and spread some genetics, but then they're mating with local stock. So you're only really getting the pure stock when you buy from those reputable breeders that are staying true to the type. Okay. So these are the this plan of the week for beekeepers. And of course, we're here in northwestern Pennsylvania, but the eastern side of the state, things seem to be doing about the same thing. You need to be supering if you're not supering already. Checkerboarding, pulling frames, supering up, uh, giving them extra room because even with the lack of rain, there are enough resources out there that uh, they're really building up. <laughs> so I can't explain it. I don't know what's going on. So the thing is you want to monitor for queenless behavior. And I think a great way for you to figure that out is to just look at all your landing boards. So get out there anywhere from 11 in the morning to three in the afternoon. Uh, that's max foraging time and uh, count and keep a log. It's a great exercise for kids too. How many pollen loaded bees are coming in? If it's more than 10 per minute, you've got a very good uh, brood production going on there uh, because you could have sparse pollen coming in if you were absent a queen and had laying workers, but that means you haven't been paying attention for over three weeks. So this is a time of year where very close monitoring is going to pay off a lot later in the year. And if you find something queenless, you're not too late to pull a frame of brood with eggs from another colony and insert them 
and allow them to recover. The longer you wait, the more difficult recovery is and the more bees that colony loses while they're waiting for a new queen to be uh, present in that colony. So the other option you have is if you find a queenless colony, don't let laying workers uh, develop in there. You can combine them with another strong colony if you want to, or maybe you've got a couple of low performing colonies, you can make one decent performing colony out of those. And the thing there would be that you add the weaker colony to the stronger one. So these are just options that you have. Make sure there's fresh water everywhere so that your bees, I'm using that micro mist on the hose and spraying it on a cinder block wall that I set up in my bee yard and it's working really well. There are no pools of water. It just keeps the cinder blocks damp during the heat of the day and it uh, generates, a, it uses up a quarter of a gallon a minute. So that's not a lot of water and it's feeding and it's a mist so it actually cools down wind. And when the wind shifts direction, it blows it around. It's in the middle of the apiary so it also blows the misty water onto different hives. Kind of cool to do. Uh, and it's a great opportunity now because it was a puzzle for me. What kind of flowers are they on? Go on a hike, take a look. There's uh, an app for your phone, it's called PlantNet, and you can take pictures of uh, the different plants that you come across that your bees are on, and you can keep a journal this time of year what your bees are on. And they're actually on ground ivy, which is something I never even paid attention to before. And as I mentioned, white clover is blooming now, so I think that has a lot to do with the current nectar flow situation. We have a lot going on. So milkweed is you know knee high already here, so we can expect milkweed to start blooming within the next couple of weeks. And uh, I think we're good here. So I wanna thank you for spending your time with me here today. If you have a question of your own that you would like to have considered for another Q&A on a Friday, please follow the link down in the video description and it will take you to my website, thewaytobe.org, and you can click on the page marked the way to be. You have to fill out that form there and then we'll look at those and there's a chance that we'll be addressing your topic one of these Fridays coming up. So thanks for spending your time with me here today. I hope everything is great with your bees wherever you are. Have a good weekend. Mm -hmm.